Thank you very much for the introduction. Is this uh, okay that I have on? Everybody can hear? I seem to be on. I don't know if you can hear anything. Maybe I'll put... Okay, is that better? So you don't have to strain when you're here. So welcome, everybody. I'm really happy to give this lecture. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of demonstrations to show you. And uh, this is actually a physics lecture, so we're going to be introducing some things about physics in the beginning. But what I want to get across to you is uh, how important light is for biology, how important light is for physics, actually. And since you're all here for some sort of a physics lecture, we're going to spend a little bit of time with a lot of demonstrations trying to get the idea across, for instance, what light is and how light interacts with matter and things like this. And I think we can actually go through and get a very nice uh, introduction to that without actually, if I can get my, my, uh, myself straight here, what I'm trying to do. Uh, we're going to be talking about illuminating light with biology. Uh, we're going to end up talking about using light in order to do things, for instance, like diagnosing disease and also even for phototherapy, what's called phototherapy. It's a possibility they use it for certain types of cancers. Uh, and we'll mention that. We've used it on little worms. If I have time, I'll show about a worm and so forth. But in the very beginning, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, what photons are. Uh, now, if there was somebody in the room here who really knows what people know about photons, you know that we don't really know a lot about photons. There's still a lot to find out. We know quite a bit about them, but they're not exactly what you think you might uh, want to have. And this has been done over a long time in the history of biophysics, and uh, used in biophysics, but it's been over a long time in physics, and that's what we're going to go through first. So first of all, let's think a little bit about what a photon is. After all, after all what we have here is, is light in this room. If you calculate the number of photons that are coming out uh, of a 100-watt bulb, okay, you end up with hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, 10 to the 12 um, uh, photons, which is quite a bit, considering the depth that we have is 10 to the 12, about, for uh, that they're thinking of sinking into the, uh, into the economy, and we have many, many more per second coming out. So this room is filled up with photons, zillions of them, right? And what we want to do is like, see, uh, what are they really? Well, the normal way of thinking about light is, of course, you have light going into some prism and it's separated into some sort of colors. And you all know that uh, those of you who have taken any sort of physics courses, you think about it being a wave, right? Is light a wave? No. Is light a pure particle? No. It's sort of a combination of both, and that's what we want to get back, that's what we want to get on. The idea uh, in the beginning of time, so to speak, other than somebody called Newton, who you all know from Newton's laws, was that light is actually waves, and only waves. And then there was ideas that came along, and people changed their ideas, and we now know that light consists out of photons, and we'll show that. They're individual particles, and it's a good thing they're individual particles, as we'll see, especially for biology, because if they weren't individual particles, we wouldn't be here, okay? If light was behaved differently just like a wave, which we'll see. So what are some of the basic concepts? Let's go back and see where the idea of a photon and of light came from in the very beginning. Now, you may not know this and think about this really, but if you turn on a light bulb, for instance like this one, and you have a very, very low amount of current going through, and you'll see that, okay, can you see that? I think probably without turning out the lights, you can turn down the lights a little bit. And what we see is something that is red, right? And as we bring this up to a higher and higher temperature by putting more and more current through, this is something you all actually know, it goes more into the yellow, and eventually, if we went up high enough, it gets to us, it looks like white, but it actually goes into the blue region. Now, there are, uh, this was known for a long time, and as a matter of fact, it was used tens of thousands of years ago, or let's say 10,000 years ago, somebody in history is going to catch me on that, 5,000 years ago, by people who made ceramics. Because how do you know how hot you want to heat an oven when you're making ceramics. <coughs> if you go, there are different types of clays, different types of ways of making ceramics, right? It comes from the soil. And they had to know, for different ceramics, they had to take uh, the material and heat it up to different temperatures. And how did they know what the temperature was? They didn't have a thermometer. How do we know even now? 
And if you even ask people who make ceramics now, they do it in the way that they say they know that there, as I said before, as you go up higher in temperature inside of an oven, if you think about an oven, it goes more toward the blue and it changes the color. So what they had, even 5,000 years ago, was the fact that when they wanted to make certain uh, ceramics, maybe they required a cherry red, other ones required a yellow. And you all know this from coals, if you look at the coals of a fire. When the fire has gone down in the temperature and it's not so hot, it's a little bit red, right? And when you go more and more and it gets hotter, it goes more toward the blue. Okay, that's essentially what happens. There was such a thing called a black body, which physicists used to work in, which was essentially a big oven. It was a big oven with a hole in it, and they watched the radiation come out, and then they looked at the spectrum. They looked at the wavelength of light, and they changed the temperature, and they looked how, how much red, how much green, and how much blue was there in a spectrum. And they looked, of course, at different wavelengths that we can't see also, but we won't talk about that. We'll only talk about the part that's, uh, that's visible. Same thing, like I said, in the coals. So, and the box can be made of anything. And for physicists to know that something is universal, that no matter what temperature anything is at, okay, it has the same sort of behavior, that means there's something very fundamental going on. And they didn't understand that at all at the time. So as we increase the temperature, as you see here, we increase the temperature, and we get a spectrum, and this is going blue in this way, because this, for instance, x-rays, UV, visible is only a small part of the spectrum, and everything else, we get some sort of a distribution like this. And the higher the temperature goes, the more it shifts over to the blue. Well, physicists tried to understand this, and they tried to understand it from the point of view of only waves. Okay, that's the sort of thing that you think of, waves, right, when you think of light. There was a problem with that, and that is that the only way that they could ha understand it was to say that, okay, if light is waves, and we have light of different colors, they use something called modes, which I'm not going to go over. And what they tried to do was stuff these in. This is a long wavelength, this would be red. These are short wavelengths, this would be blue. And it turns out, when you go through a, a theory of waves, that you can stuff a lot more blue things in there than you can red, because the wavelength's much smaller. So you can sort of see here that since these are smaller, you're going to be able to have small frequency differences that you can stuff in this little box here. And they did these calculations, and they found out something called the ultraviolet catastrophe. And that was, they could get so much more blue in there, according to this theory, that they, had, they eventually formed an ultraviolet catastrophe. And that meant that as they, uh, the waves didn't work, the theory didn't work, because their experimental uh, system said that as the wavelength got shorter, and it would go all the way up to infinity, and you'd have an ultraviolet catastrophe. By the way, I won't play it. I have it. There is, I don't know if anybody knows this, there's a rock group that's called an ultraviolet catastrophe. That's what they call themselves. Actually, they are a catastrophe, I think. <laughs> uh, I, that's why I'm not playing it. They didn't sound interesting to anybody that I could think of. Does anybody here know them? You can look it up on the web. You can get the ultraviolet catastrophe, a different uh, a view of it. So that didn't work. Okay, so <coughs> that was around the turn of the century. And there were different ideas about that. Some physicists said they thought they understood everything and there was something wrong with the experiments. Other people quit, retired, went fishing. And, but there was real gold in there. There were Nobel Prizes for this sort of thing. And <coughs> actually some people got them for this theory. So who was the first one that did that? Max Planck. It's interesting that Max Planck did this because he created one of the biggest revolutions that's ever been done in physics. And that is, we know in everyday things that everything seems to behave in a continuous way, right? We don't notice any jumps and things like that. When you get down to very small things, what he said was uh, that, that actually in order to explain this, and he didn't know what he was doing in the beginning, he said in order to explain this, he simply said that when light falls down onto, onto the walls of this black body, if you remember this oven that they're looking at it, that the oven can only exchange energy in little clumps. Okay, that's all he said. He put that into his theory, he did some calculations, and voila, he could actually explain that curve. All he had to do was, and this is, him, oops, sorry, pushing the wrong buttons here. So you already know all the secrets here that I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so uh, he quantized the energy, and he said that in the walls of the box, 
you had different levels of energy. You couldn't have anything in between at that temperature for these particular little... Uh, he, didn't, he didn't hypothesize that light was a photon. He still said light was some sort of a, an oscillatory behavior. It was a wave. But what he did say was that the box could only exchange energy in little clumps. Okay? Now, uh, if you go a little bit further with that, okay, it's, it, he actually went home on the, on the evening that he came up with that idea, and he realized that he could fit the data really well. He came up with a certain constant, which you'll get in physics later, maybe you've already had it, called Planck's constant. And that was what the constant that had to go in to explain these little levels here, depending on the frequency. So, and that was weird, because nobody had ever thought that energy was exchanged only in lumps. And we'll see how important this is. This is important for biology. It's very important for photosynthesis. It's the reason that we're here on Earth, actually, is because that can happen when you, when you actually think about it. So he went home to his wife that evening, and he told her, you know what? He said, I've come up with a theory, and either in the future I'm going to be Nobel Prize quality and people are going to think that I'm a genius, or I'm going to ruin my whole career. <laughs> Because that is how revolutionary it was. Interesting enough, he was one of the most conservative people around at that time. He, he was, he was uh, sort of in his everyday life, he was very conservative. But he made a huge leap. And he had the courage to make it. And actually, uh, he kept on going. But we don't yet li have light as a photon, right? Now, how can you use his theory? I'll just mention this. I'm not going to go over. doesn't have maybe anything to do with biology. How do you measure the temperature of a star? How do you measure the, the temperature of the background radiation in the universe? Okay, that's way here. These are, these are, well, it's the end of the universe, more to speak, so to speak, of what we know, and we know what temperatures are out here, and we know the temperature of the sun. What do you do? You put it into a spectrometer, you look at this behavior, and that tells you what the temperature is, okay? So you can actually do that. That's why the oven works, okay? That's why when you have an oven, you can tell what the temperature is. For exactly the same reason, you can actually tell. All of you, you can tell what your temperature is. That's the way things work, by just looking at the spectra of what comes out of you. It goes all the way down into the infrared, right? So any, you can tell the temperature of anything. You can tell the temperature of a plant. You can tell the temperature of things if you could actually have the right spectrometer to go down. Okay, this is, for instance, very, very low. This belongs here to the temperature of the background of the universe. Then along came something, the idea of photons. The photons come in clumps. Uh, that's a hard thing to understand, in a way. Uh, it's not easy. Believe me, it's not easy. And, and, uh, but, uh, uh, and that is ex uh, explained a little bit that maybe Einstein was the one who then came up with the idea of a photon. He didn't call it a photon, but he called it quantized light. So where did he get that idea? At that time, uh, he was out of work. Uh, he'd gone to the university. Nobody would hire him at that time into an academic position, so he went off to be a patent lawyer, uh, well, not to be a patent lawyer, to be a patent scientist, where he was working on patents. And he was in Bern, Switzerland, which is a very pretty city, where also a very conservative place. And he went there, and while he was there, he really enjoyed himself, because he says, look, I'm doing a patent job. I go to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, I get off at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I have the rest of the day to myself, I don't have to do anything. Don't have to sit at committee meetings, don't have to teach, don't have to do anything, I can just think. And that's what he did. He came up with some wonderful things, only one of which we're interested in right now. There was such a thing known uh, as a photoelectric effect. And that was that when light actually comes down and hits uh, the surface of a metal, uh, the, the light that comes, the, the electrons that come out have a certain kinetic energy. And they have a certain kinetic energy independent of how strong that light is, as long as the light's there. Now, that's a very weird concept, right? What that means is if we really raise the intensity of light and we have the light come down and actually hit the surface of, of these metals and then measure the kinetic energy of these electrons that come out, what we see is they have the same, no matter what sort of, as long as the light has the same color, they have the same energy. So he got the idea of a photon and, uh, and his, here's his, the idea that he had of photons. It's not... Uh, for him, it wasn't uh, too hard, I guess, uh, to think of. As a matter of fact, his, his paper is very interesting to read. So it's simple. So now we have two things that are required to understand how light interacts with biology. And they're very important, actually. We have the fact that the plants themselves and everything else, 
We ourselves, everything that we have, you guys are all dressed in a lot of colors. Everything is due to quantum jumps, okay? The fact that in the material itself, you can only exchange energy in jumps. And now we know also that light exists apparently out of small particles, right? How, now these, these particles are as the following. Uh, you can hear this. What we're going to do is it's a very similar sort of an idea. We have here some radioactive compounds. Very well locked up. <laughs> hmm. oh. oh, there you go. Push the buttons. Okay. Now, essentially, gamma rays and things like that are light at very, very high intensity, and this is a uh, this is a, 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 a quantum counter for the gamma rays, if you want and you can hear them, right? Those are little bits of, of uh, everybody can hear that. You probably heard it before. Those are the little things that Einstein was talking about when he was shining light, more or less. These are individuals. The light comes down, hits actually the, uh, the surface of something, and interacts uh, as, a, as a particle. Because when the light actually hits, boom, you hear the, you hear the, the result. And that's because light is little balls, okay, in a way. Is it little balls? Not quite, <coughs> but it does react a little bit like uh, small balls. But, and this is something that's interesting, it's pretty weird, and uh, that is if you, let's, let's take a look at the real difference of what we're talking about. May not, you may not recognize the uh, revolutionary part of this, okay? Let's say that you're on an ocean. So you're sitting in an ocean out here and the waves have a certain frequency and they get really big. Right? That's bad for you, right? I mean, there's a lot of energy in those waves. What this says, okay, if these uh, little particles behave in quantum mechanics like little particles and you have this energy all bundled up in a little sort of a particle-like material, is that when you raise the intensity of these slow waves, it doesn't bother you a bit. All right? Remember that if I increase the intensity of the type of light that was a wa long wavelength, it didn't make any difference. I got the same kinetic energy coming out. However, if you then go to high frequencies, and that's what Max Planck was talking about, all of a sudden these little ripples make a big difference. And that's, and, and that's terrible. That's, that's why UV light in the sun is dangerous. That's why x-rays are dangerous. Okay, is because you don't need very many. You only need one photon. If you think about mutations in biology, if something comes in and hits a certain part of your chromosome, you only need one, okay? If that one interacts correctly with the right place in your chromosome, it can give you a mutation that can sometimes cause cancer. That's what causes skin cancer, actually, in that way. So that's a very important thing for biology, right? It's a big advantage, as we'll see, for photosynthesis, but it's a very dangerous thing for us going out into the sun because you can sit around for long times in the low intensity it does make a difference if you raise the intensity. Why? Because you're getting a lot more photons, right, falling on you. So the chance of doing some damage is increasing. But if it's there, if that's why the ozone, you know, the ozone hole and so forth is so important to understand, is because that lets through these wavelengths that are very high energy, okay? And it only takes one, because it only takes one photon uh, to come in and hit the right place in the chromosome in order to cause something. And that's why I was supposed to show that demo. But this is an example of actually looking at diffraction, uh, uh, interference effects of light. If you have long exposure, you get a nice interference effect where you're shining through some sort of a slit. And over here, when you start to look at the beginning of the experiment, you see there's a photon that landed here, one here, one here, one here, more here. And you keep adding them up as they come down. So they're individual, OK? So that we don't now, too. OK, now what's a chroma, what's a chroma for? Well, there was a guy called de Broglie who uh, was a historian. Actually, he was a, he was a PhD in history. And he had a brother who was getting his PhD in physics. And his brother told him, what are you wasting your time in history for? I'm not saying that history is a waste of time. But he said, what are you doing that for? It's really exciting what's going on in physics. And this was in the early 1900s. Uh, so he actually changed and he wrote, he wrote a thesis where he said, well, look, if waves of light act like particles, then particles must act like waves. That was his general idea. Nice idea, right? 
All the physicists hadn't thought of it at that time. Okay, so he got all excited about this idea and did a bunch of calculations, wrote a good thesis, handed it in to his professors in Paris, and they didn't know what to do with it. You know, what a ridiculous idea. So they could have thrown it out the window, but why didn't they throw it out the window? Why didn't they tell him to go back and do something else? He was a count, okay? You don't mess with a count at that time in France, <laughs> right? So uh, they sent it off to Einstein, and they said to Einstein, take a look at this thesis and see if it's any good. Einstein wrote back a famous saying that de Broglie has lifted the great veil. What he meant was that he has come up with an idea that we should have all known, okay, but uh, it's a very general idea, the fact that particles act like waves. And that means electrons act like waves. That means we act like waves. Buses act like waves. We can't see them because the wavelength is so short. When you go through that, we're not going to talk about that. But particles actually act like waves. Now, we're getting a little bit close, and don't worry, that I'm not going to talk about these. Uh, these are the uh, these are dyes. They're the type of things that fluoresce that we'll talk about in a, in just a little while. And what you see is um, uh, then along came a guy called Schrödinger, and this is also an interesting story because Schrödinger was working at that time in a laboratory in in Switzerland where a fellow called Debye was working, and he was the head of an institute. And uh, some Einstein or somebody sent to uh, Debye. Uh, de Broglie's thesis. See, this could all be your thesis that you write at some time. So he sent his thesis. And he said, uh, I think this is interesting. Could you come back next week and report on it in our journal club? So Schrodinger came back the next day and said, I think this is trash. I don't want to talk about it. And, uh, and uh, uh, Dubai said, no, it's really something worthwhile. Go back and read it tonight. So he went back and read it again. And he found out uh, that he got really interested in this. So he took... Uh, uh, so de Broglie, I mean, uh, Debye told him, okay, where there is a wave, there must be a wave equation. And he asked Schrodinger to go find uh, the wave equation. It was about Christmas time, and that's exactly what Schrodinger did. I can't remember if I have a picture of it. Uh, no, I don't, unfortunately. But there was a, there was a place in his, uh, where he went up into the mountains in Switzerland that he knew before. He went to a certain hotel. I've written that hotel. I asked them if they knew that Schrodinger created uh, the, the Schrodinger equation there in that hotel, in that very hotel weeks. They didn't know. I sent them a whole bunch of material and told them to put it up on their walls. They said they would, but I haven't been there to see if it's true. But it's, it's turned into a different place now. It's just for rich people. So if you're, if you're rich, you like to ski, that's where you go. But you don't go there to look at Schrodinger's equation. OK, now, the idea that Schrodinger came up with was that somehow, inside of an atom, uh, there must be some sort of waves that are going on. You see, now we're getting particles, waves, everything mixed up. By that time, people had thought of electrons as particles. Along comes de Broglie and says that particles are maybe waves. Along comes Einstein and says de Broglie might be right. People paid attention. <laughs> so uh, he went off and he came up with the Schrodinger equation. Now, I actually have a picture somewhere else of the original equation that he wrote down. And so he came back and he reported on it and, of course, became very famous, and everybody who's in physics has to work with the Schrodinger equation, because when you take electrons, and when you tighten them into a confined place, the electrons have to have what? Remember what Max Planck said? Energy levels, right? They have to have discrete levels of energy. That is, these little waves that he came up with when you solve his equation, which we're obviously not going to do, are going to be certain types of ones, and they're going to make waves. And we're going to see in a minute a very uh, vivid example of how that takes place. So that's a summary of where we are, right? We know that uh, everything in, in atoms and also in material exists out of quantized steps, right? They're not continuous. We know that the, uh, that the photons actually exist in somewhat the same way, and we have a way to calculate all this. So now let's take a look. Uh, it is confusing. It's not only confusing to you, maybe. It's confusing to... Uh, people, when they first of all hear it, it's confusing to graduate students, it's confusing to people who work with it for a long time sometimes. Uh, it has different types of, 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 of things. So uh, it, is a, it is a weird thing. It's sort of like the Cheshire Cat. Uh, sometimes you think you understand it, and then you come back and you use certain equations. And I don't know if you have the same feeling sometimes, but, uh, and that's what, we, that's what we tell people. But on the other hand, we do have the way to understand it, right? We can describe it. We don't describe it philosophically. We describe it with equations that tell us what happens. And those equations 
have always come out, except for certain things that are relativistic, they always come out to be correct. All right? But that doesn't mean we understand everything to the basis of, uh, of everything else. So there's lots left to you guys if you want to become physicists. There's a, there's a lot to do uh, still in that field. And we have actually somebody in our department, Paul Criad, who just works with photons. And not only that, he only works with single photons. I don't know if he's going to give one of the talks. But, uh, you know, he sends a single photon along and he's got all this information that he stores in this little photon. And that is supposed to be used, uh, you know, the people even, well, I don't know if he's doing that, but people in the FBI are interested in this because you can put all sorts of information into a photon, you can send it away, and uh, nobody else, uh, you can check whether anybody's listening to you and things like that. Okay, now what happens when a photon meets a chromophore? And uh, so you've got a photon coming in that has wave properties and everything else. It actually hits that chromophore that's in some sort of a low energy state. Remember that I said that the higher the energy is, the more wiggles we have in our waves. Okay? And this is like a Schrodinger solution of a magic molecule. Okay? And then uh, <coughs> it absorbs that and it goes into an excited state that is a much higher energy than in the ground state. And I want to give a demonstration here of what that's like because it's the same thing up here and I want, to, I want you to come down later and actually feel it. If I take a, uh, this is a drum, it's exactly what we have up there, there's a lot of rubber here, okay? And we've got a woofer down below. So we can turn this up and we can start to get uh, places where it doesn't move at all and we can have other places where it moves a lot. So if I put this in a place where the ball doesn't move very much at all, even though it's a very large, uh, and you see I can find other places where it's really bumping around a lot. That's one of those waves. And this is the place in the middle. If I do this correctly, I know it's hard to find. I can actually keep the ball there. And then if it runs over somewhere else, it will eventually hit something and pop off. Okay? That's that sort of wave that I'm talking about. And those waves exist inside of molecules like that. I mean, a wave property. That is, there's places where you have a much bigger probability of having some sort of an electron inside of this atom and other places where you have a much smaller probability. And we'll have another demonstration where I've got some people to help me uh, about this in just a little while. Okay, now, what can an excited chromophore tell us? Now we're getting into the part. We understand what photons are. We understand what the, that the molecules are all in, in, in different energy states. That took a long time to get there, all right? Uh, what we don't know is what the chromophore can tell us. And now it's an interesting story because it started a long time ago. I want to tell you how, how does this molecule come down from the excited state. And there's a very pretty way to show that. There is a place called Bologna in Italy. Very pretty place. It's actually where Bologna comes from, okay? Same thing. But it also is a place where there's a stone called the Bolognian stone. That stone is very, very famous. Okay? That stone was called, if you've ever read in books, that's the philosopher's stone. It was a, it was a shoe cobbler who went up, who was interested in alchemy at that time. He went up into the mountains around Bologna and he gathered this sort of mineral. And he then found out that if he put it into an oven and then brought it out, it actually phosphoresced for a long time. And I want to show you something that's very similar to that. So, uh, and this was dealt with. It was very famous. There were people, uh, great uh, people for hundreds of years, a few hundred years that came down to see it, like Goethe, who's the famous poet in Germany, made a trip down to Italy just to see the Bologna stone. And it was, they didn't know what to make of it. And we'll see the reason why it was so colorful. And then it was written up in a book here. The guy, whoops, the guy who, uh, who, who, first of all, in India was called Vincenzo Cassiarola. He was the one, he was the shoemaker, okay, who went up and found it. He's one of the only shoemakers I can name, probably. And uh, there's also Fortuny Licente, okay, who wrote a book a long time ago and was the one who described what was there. And these guys, believe it or not, understood sort of what was going on. They didn't have, you guys have so much more advantage than, he, than they did. You know now what a photon is, right? You know that they're in little bundles. You know that there's energy levels and everything else. He didn't know that. But what they did know was that light came in and these minerals actually captured it. Okay? So what we want to show, hope this is the right way. To, no, I think it'll show it actually here.
Okay, if you could turn down the lights, we can turn all, off all the lights. And I'll turn off the middle thing here. These are uh, minerals, very similar to the sort of mineral you had. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this back there, but these are stones. These are mineral stones. If you're interested in fluorescence of minerals, there's a lot of them out there, okay, in the world. So you can see them. This, as a matter of fact, maybe somebody can explain to me. It looks like flint, and I didn't know that flint actually fluoresces. So what's happening here is that the light is coming in, the photon's coming in, and they're hitting this material. And when they hit the material here, okay, they are uh, bringing it up to an excited state, and it's actually f fluorescing. And you can see this here. Uh, these are, are, are not minerals, and they don't fluoresce at all when I'm not shining any light on them. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute, what that means. So what these guys did in the Philosopher's Stone, it lasted for a long enough time. They actually took this stone, brought it into a dark cave, and they could read with it for a long time, right? And that's why they didn't, it was like magic, right? They didn't really understand what was going on. Now, I want you to watch what happens when I turn off this light. You see how that goes down with time? Actually, the same thing happens when I turn it on. It goes up with time. So what's happening is that this, this luminescence comes out for a long, long time. Now, the luminescence, when you actually look at it, uh, they found out that you could, for instance, read with it, right? Uh, they didn't have transparencies, but that's the easiest way to show this, is some sort of transparency. So uh, they can actually take it into a cave and read. I don't know if that's why it was called a philosopher's stone. Now, I want you to see what's happening when I turn the light off again. We see up there, uh, you can see it best up there, the fluorescence goes down. And see, it's lasting for a very long time. That is, we're seeing this fluorescence down here for quite a long time after we've turned it off. As a matter of fact, it stays for a long time. And if I stood back there and took a look at it, uh, you would be able to actually put some, you can actually put something in and read yourself, just as they did with the Bologna stone. So could I have some of the lights again so I can find laser pointer? <laughs> I'm always losing laser pointers and chips. And Anybody know where it is? Ah, up here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, so that's the Bologna stone. Uh, now, what's happening, what, what's, what's happening in our molecule when it goes up to an excited state? That's the wrong button. Okay, you've got a photon that comes in. It brings the molecule to the excited state. And now what I want you to think of in order to understand this is think of yourself, okay, as a molecule. And I'm going to put you in the excited state. And you're lucky I'm not going to do it in a real experiment, but picture you're in this room all alone. I come into the room, and I put down something here, and I say, look, here's a bomb. It's going to go off. And uh, I have up in the back one door open. And then what I do is I turn out all the lights. And you don't know where the door is. And you run around the room. And I stand outside of that door, and I see how long it takes you to get out. Right? You're very excited. So you're running around the room. You're banging into the walls. And uh, so then I convince you that everything's OK, and I, uh, that you go back inside of the room again. And uh, again, I put, would you go back inside of the room? Probably not, huh? And then, and then I convince you to go back in again. And I do the same thing. And I wait and see how long it took you to get out. And if we do this many times with one person, I guess that's enough to see. If we do this enough times, and we look at the amount of time that it took you to get out of the room, that's time in this direction, and how many times you came out with that time, when we count them up and we average them, we get something like that, which comes down like an exponential decay. In other words, it makes sense. You come out with the highest probability right in the beginning, because somehow you may bump into the wall, and everything else. Now, does that, that's what happens in fluorescence, believe it or not. This molecule goes up in the excited state. No, really, when it wants to come down, it just has a certain rate of coming down. So the molecule uh, emits a photon, as I said, like a probability. It goes down, just like you saw that light go down. Okay, in this sort of a way. Okay, now, now I do another experiment. Okay, I now open up two doors, and this is an important thing to understand, because I open up two doors, but I only stand out there in the fluorescence door. Okay, that's the fluorescence door up there. That's the door where that door I also open up. And I do the experiment with you. Somehow you always get excited when I bring a bomb in, but you always uh, forgive me and come back and uh, let me do the experiment again. Okay? Now, what, what is going to happen? 
What's going to happen is I'm going to see fewer people go out that door, right? Fewer times you're going to go out that door. Sometimes you're going to find that one. So I can tell whether that door was open just counting that how many times you came out that door, right? Everybody see that? There's two doors now. Now, another thing I can tell is I look at how fast you went out of the room. Right? I told you this exponential decay. If I open up that door, now there's two doors open, you must get out faster, right? You're randomly going around the room, you must get out faster. And then I open up three doors. You get out even faster. And the fewer things go out that door. What that tells me is, aha, I can use photons of fluorescence like a spy. Okay? They can tell me something. They're messengers. I can put in fluorophores into something, and I can tell how many doors are open for this certain thing to go out. If I do that, there's, I'm not going to go into this at all. There's a whole bunch of doors that they could go out. And this tells me many, many things. And this is what we do. This is what a photophysicist does. It's also what, uh, especially what we use in biology. We're using these molecules of fluoresce, like these, whoops. We're using the molecules of fluoresce like uh, these, okay. We'll see, what, we're even doing things like sticking them into bodies or we're looking at, at uh, photosynthesis. And then we're, we're asking ourselves, which doors are open? And we get that information by just looking at that door, seeing how fast it went down and seeing how many went out that door. All right? So the, uh, so the photons are our messengers, and these little dyes or whatever is fluorescing are our spies. Okay, that's what it says here. The photons are the molecules of the spies. Okay, now, now we are through most uh, with the beginning of the physics. We want to show some nice things that we do in biology with them. But we can get a lot of information by just looking at fluorescence, scattering, absorbance, lots of things like that. Remember, everything is quantized, and that's what's important about what we're doing. So now let's see something we can do in biology. Now, we get all excited about these experiments, right? And, uh, and uh, maybe my excitement will increase once I start talking about biology, what we're doing with it. But uh, uh, we do get very excited, and some people can't really understand what's going on. But uh, we get very excited about it, and we develop certain techniques in order to look inside of bodies, inside of plants, inside of cells, and try to see what's going on just by using that trick, the door trick, right? We're just seeing how many photons come out, how fast they come out, when we do different things to these uh, parts in biology. So that's a nice picture of biology and plants. We're going to talk about plants first. Everybody knows that here especially. The uh, important thing to realize is that plants have something called chlorophyll in them. And chlorophyll is a, uh, a substance which fluoresces like mad. I'll show you that in a minute. As a matter of fact, just to give you a little preview, I've got, a, whoops, always punching the wrong button. I've got a plant here, and there's caterpillars on it. We're going to talk about caterpillars and what they do to plants and how we use the fluorescence in order to look at that. But notice that the plants actually absorb in the red. And I'm going to give you all a test in a minute, okay? So pay attention to what I'm saying, and then maybe you'll get the right, uh, you, you, you guess right. It absorbs in the blue, and it absorbs in the red. Okay, the chlorophyll. What happens when the leaves turn? That's what's happening now. So this is a good example because it's in the fall. You can go out and look at the leaves. Why do the leaves turn red? Does something red get into them? Or what's going on? So what's happening, actually, is, uh, is the following. Like I said, chlorophyll itself, which is in all plants, chlorophyll is, is the substance in plants which gathers the energy and uses it through electron chains in order to make the energy of a plant. It's what we're trying to do also at this university to a tune of, of uh, several hundreds of millions of dollars that was actually given by BP, which is a strange thing, but they did, in order to try to understand how to use plants for energy. Okay? And plants are very efficient at this in some respects. Not in all respects, but in some respects they're very efficient. And then along comes fall. You see this is a green tree. And along comes fall, we don't have this absorbance anymore. This went away, right? This was always there. If you take a look at it, you went back here, you had the absorbance of the, of, the, uh, of the chlorophyll and the absorbance of these other things that are called carotenoids and stuff like this. Now you go down and it turns into fall. And what the, what the plants do in the fall, if you want to look at it that way, is eat up the, the chlorophyll. Okay? The chlorophyll gets uh, used up and it's not useful anymore. The plant is finished making its photosynthesis. It's about time to go to winter, so it wants to hibernate in a way. Okay, so what we then have is something that has changed color because we got rid of something, not because we added something. Notice that we've added, so what we now have is only something that absorbs in the blue, and if something only absorbs in the blue, what do we see? Red, right? Because the blue gets absorbed. Okay, now I want to have my 
Helpers come down. There's three helpers that I asked to catch. I have one thrower and two catchers, right? If you guys could come down to do it, this is your test, okay? The rest, they don't have to. <laughs> okay, so you're the thrower, right? Oh, you're a catcher. You're, you're a thrower, I guess. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't worry. Uh, now, you want it to be blue, red, okay? Okay, now, now you've got trees coming down, and we're going to have photons come in. And I want you to guess which one it is. Um, that's a tree that's in the fall. And that's a tree, it's supposed to be green, but it's blue. That's a, that's a tree that's in the blue over here. Come over here just a little bit more, a little bit closer so that she can throw it to you. Now, what's going to happen when we throw that, and these are photons that you have, okay? So don't throw hard, but when she throws the red photon at the red tree, okay? Just look what, what, is, what is going to happen, All right? Nothing much, right? It's going to bounce off. And now she's going to throw the blue photon at the red plant. Okay, so this is a red tree, and she throws the blue photon, it gets caught. Okay, it gets absorbed, because the blue photon is absorbed. If she takes the blue ball and throws it at the blue plant, or the green plant, all right, we see the blue, because it's reflected back at us, right? If she throws the red ball at the blue, because now that's it, it's the same thing we were talking about, it gets absorbed, right? It's as simple as that. And these are the same sort of principles that happen with photons, right? You can see the trees green because the light's reflected and the plant doesn't absorb green. Now, we have one of the world experts right here, Professor Covinji, who maybe afterwards can explain, and thank you very much for showing the demonstration and you guys for catching. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> uh, maybe he can explain why afterwards, but it might be confusing if you remember, uh, your eyes are most sensitive to the green. And actually, there's more green coming through. And so why, why, why don't plants like to absorb in the green? There's all this energy that gets wasted, right? Uh, the plants only absorb out here in the chlorophyll when they're working in the red and in the blue. But they seem to have left out the green. There must be an evolutionary reason for that. And I'll let Govinji do that sometime <laughs> to tell us why. Um, OK, so we got plants that actually turn color. You can use this with everything. Have you ever noticed, if you could turn the lights down, these that are canned, they don't look very interesting, right? They look pretty drab, actually. And you take fresh peas or frozen peas, and they're very green. That's because you have now different things have happened. You've oxidized different sorts of pigments inside of those peas, right, that, that actually change their color and so forth. And we can use that. You remember now that plants actually have, as we've talked about, uh, Sunlight shines on the plants. And this is now what we want to use is our knowledge of what these are that's falling on these plants. The plants absorb only certain in levels. It's a good thing that they do only absorb levels, but they absorb only levels. And then they undergo their photosynthesis, and we take a microscope and so forth and try to look at it. Now, an important problem especially here is things like uh, caterpillars. And uh, I guess we need all the lights on. For, and you'll see I've got my... There we go. Okay. Whoops, that's interesting. What happened to the caterpillar? He didn't like it. The ca <laughs> what? Oh, under the leaf, okay. Oh, you can see it there, okay. Well, you guys can come up and see them later, all right, the, the caterpillars. I want to show you something else. So there is a caterpillar here. Uh, turn on the lights again. There's a caterpillar right here. Can you see it? That's under the leaf. And these caterpillars do dangerous things, actually, to plants. And there's also called a looper, which does things. And the things that it does is uh, they eat up plants. And then the question comes, what are the caterpillars doing when they're eating up in the plants? And can we use our knowledge of, of photophysics in order to study that, remembering everything that we have? So we've done these sort of studies uh, in order to see that. And this is a cabbage looper. This is the same sort of black swallowtail that you'll see over here. And I thought it'd be interesting to bring them in, because you can see what they do. They do eat up certain plants. Don't touch this plant. It happens to be a... It'll make you, it's not poison ivy or anything. It's a phototoxic uh, uh, protection on the plant. But actually, they come in and they eat it up and do things. And let's see the sort of experiments that we can do. So we can actually look then. We actually have ways to not only measure just one, one point of fluorescence. We actually have developed instruments, and that's one of the things that I do, that, that, that measure these time-resolved, nanosecond time-resolved. Nanoseconds is a really, really small time and uh, decay of these uh, chlorophylls. And um, in order to, to do this, we look at what they do. And look what these, 
these caterpillars eat up the plants in certain ways. And what we do is we use our, our, our technique to look at the damage that's in the plants. What's interesting for people who are, who are uh, involved in, uh, in growing plants is the fact that these caterpillars, they eat up parts of the plants. Do they only actually destroy just due to the hole? I mean, are they just making the plant work less efficient because of the hole, or are they inject toxin? Now, I'm not an expert in the biology of this, but what we have found out is that when we look at it with our techniques of understanding everything that we understood before that I told you about, looking at the lifetime of decay, and it's a very complicated system, which I'm not even going to start to go over in photosynthesis, but we've come to the conclusion that there are other things that happen to the plant other than just uh, the hole that's being made in the plant that we can actually see that takes place. This is interesting because it's a footprint. If you, if you, I don't know if you guys know, and uh, you can actually try this in your high school laboratories. Uh, if you take, uh, well, not with the caterpillar, you don't have, these are foot, footprints of the caterpillar. You take a caterpillar that's been on a leaf for a while, and you just take it off, and then you can look at the fluorescence of the lifetime and you see the footprints that are there. Why is that? Because there was no light that was falling on the plant when the, when the, when the feet were there, and therefore, uh, and therefore you see an image that lasts for a certain amount of time until the actual plant uh, gets back. A lot of things that you can do with these sort of experiments. Uh, this is Professor Gavinji who's sitting up here. These are other people who are involved. The original experiment by Shazin Atari. I couldn't find a picture of her <laughs> uh, uh, in time to put it in there. How do we use it for all body imaging? How many of you have heard of fluorescence proteins? Uh, you, uh, I don't agree with this, but you can actually buy fluorescent rabbits if you want to. There are people making money off of this. But there are proteins that you can attach in the chromosomes to uh, other proteins, and they fluoresce. It doesn't hurt the rabbit. The rabbit's perfectly healthy, and, the, uh, and it's found out that this, in general, does not ruin a living system when you put it in. You have to check it, but you put it on all sorts of other proteins, and it doesn't uh, ruin the system. Now I'd like to talk about something about a, uh, a pH gradient, and uh, I, need a, uh, I need a volunteer. Do you want to volunteer again? Okay, come up. <laughs> If, now, it turns out that pH is very important on your skin. How do you measure pH? Okay? So the way they do it, hold your hand out like this. Okay? So she's going to, the way they do it is to put this onto your skin like that. Okay? Let it sit there for a while. And then they come up and they take this off. Okay? I have here a layer of, a layer of molecules. It's your molecules that are on there. Came off of the skin. Okay? Then they take an, an apparatus to measure the amount of, of uh, acidity in the skin, uh, of the pH, and they, they measure this. And then they come back again, and they put another one on, and they pull off another layer. Okay? Then they put another one on, and they pull off another layer okay, of molecules like this. And they keep doing this, and they keep measuring the pH of the skin. And I'll tell you in a minute why that's important. Now I can keep, should I do this 100 times? I'll turn 100 layers off. It starts to hurt. You don't want that, right? So it's a bad thing to do, OK? So what, what uh, we did something different. Uh, it turns out that the pH gradient across your skin is very important. First of all, I'll tell you, you know, you can go to the store and buy pH 7 soap, right? It's the wrong thing, OK? Because your skin is not pH 7. As a matter of fact, OK, uh, you'll see that it's quite a bit different. Uh, the pH on the top of your skin is about 4.5 or 5.6, not pH 7. It's two orders of magnitude away, so we're looking at the, at the concentration of the, uh, of the actual uh, hydrogen ions. So what we did, we put a laser down in here, and we put a molecule which tells us what the pH is. OK? And I'm not going to explain this, but this molecule tells us we can look at the lifetime. That is, remember this decay that I had over here that was taking place in uh, a long time? Well, it turns out that these normal molecules that we use in the laboratory, uh, rather than taking such a long time to come down, uh, actually take a very short time. They're in the nanosecond region. So if I'm not exciting that anymore, it doesn't fluoresce. It's not like these molecules that are very long. It goes down in a nanosecond. Well, it turns out that we can use that rate of coming down to measure the pH down in the skin. We use something called two-photon excitation. I won't explain that right now. And then we use a certain dye that goes down in the skin. We found out then what the gradient was across the skin uh, by doing that. And it turns out that was a really big thing because nobody had ever done that before. So we didn't have to take your, your arm and do that. All we have to do is shine a light in there 
and we look at different depths. Okay, we have a way to do that. We can look at different depths, and we can find out what the pH is across the skin. Now, there's an interesting thing that comes out that was known before. The pH on a, <coughs> on a female skin has an average of about 5.5. The pH on the, on the skin of a male is about 4 to 4.5. The average, because it varies with different people. Uh, and if you know anything about pH, what does that mean? That men are sourer than women. And I, I that, okay, because uh, they, they have a, a, a sour part of their personality. Maybe that's where it comes from. <laughs> Um, the, the reason why the pH is so important across your skin, there are people who have trouble with that. That is, uh, we worked with a place in San Francisco that is now studying that. They built the instruments that we built. Uh, if you don't have this pH gradient across your skin, it turns out that you can get infected very easily by microorganisms. There's a protective mechanism, which is a coupling mechanism back. And they would like to know where this pH is, takes place, why it takes place, why it's involved with your immune system. There are people who don't have this pH gradient very much, okay, for ever since their, their birth. They have troubles, and there's certain types of sicknesses that it apparently can reduce that. So it's an important thing to do. Okay, now, how about, it's another thing that we use. I said sun was good for plants, right? It makes plants grow. Now, how many of you go out and sit in the sun in the summertime? Do you know that there's more, uh, much higher rate of skin cancer now than there was before they had all of these nice creams that you can put on yourself. And the question is why? The question isn't that the creams are bad. Well, they could be, I'll tell you in a minute. But the question isn't that the creams are bad. The reason is that people think they're protected so they lie out in the sun for a long time, okay? And actually, it, it does cause some sort of a skin cancer. So we actually tried to look at that just a little bit. And this is where it's really a good thing that, that light is in photons. Because if light was in waves, if you remember what I was talking about before, if you turned up the intensity, then no matter what, what sort of a wavelength you had, it would get really dis destructive, right? There would be a lot of energy that goes in. And you'd burn up sitting in front of a fire, all right? However, since light is in photons, it has to be the right photons in order to do it. Unfortunately, the right photons in light, in, in the sun, is many times the wrong one. So we actually undertook, undertook a study of that, too. I just want to mention that we did that. It was the first study that was done where we used two-photon excitation, went down into skin, and we found out what, what, was causing, what causes the skin cancer is that the light, it's, it's the lights up here. It's, it's also a little bit not very pleasant to think about, but your skin is all dead. I mean, everything that's on the outside is dead skin. And uh, the skin that is underneath, where the live cells are, are down here. So if you're getting this uh, more blue light, UV-type light, UV-B light that comes down into a layer where you have skin, that becomes dangerous. So what we did was study that with our methods, again using a molecule, okay, which is our messenger that we send in, I mean is our spy, that we send in and use the photons as the messenger. So we can tell when you make what's called reactive oxygen species. They're very dangerous things. They're made by light interacting with molecules in your body, in your skin. Plants, by the way, have a very nice way to get rid of this, <laughs> actually. And maybe we could use it so we'd be all green, but, but uh, we might be able to use the mechanism and learn from plants how they get rid of this. If you shine light too much on plants, they undergo certain reactions which starts to shuttle off this energy. It's something that we also studied with uh, Professor Govinji that I won't go into, okay, with our methods. So that's another thing we can use. Uh, and then we actually used it in, an, in a microscope. This is the of uh, another thing that you can do with light is if you get some sort of a skin cancer, there are now new phototherapies that they're developing, and they operate as following. You have a certain type of a molecule which makes uh, protoporphyrin, like the chlorophylls in the plant, and they make, they're the uh, precursor of all the hemes we have in our body. And it turns out that uh, if you, they do make creams now, which you can put this little molecule on the surface of your, of your body, which is not uh, bad because it's a, it's a major part of cells anyway. They go into cells themselves, and they make a, a production of a lot of protoporphyrin 9, that's these porphyrin molecules down here. Then you shine light on them, okay, and they release this energy, which makes a lot of reactive oxygen species, which for skin cancer is bad, right? But for phototherapy is good. Because if you can arrange it so these little allo molecules go into the right, into the tumors only, not into the normal tissue, you can kill the tumors. And all you do is shine light on them, okay, in order to kill the tumors. It's called phototherapy. 
and it's being used much more and more uh, for certain types. As a matter of fact, uh, I was working with somebody in Germany at the time who was doing this, and uh, there's certain types of cancers that farmers get a lot of, okay, because they're outside a lot, and it has uh, in, it almost 100% cure rate for that. And what we were doing was understanding this inside of cells, okay, that's uh, uh, what we've been doing. So I've got to finish up here pretty soon, and um, I might come back to this in a minute. I just want to talk about the, uh, no, let me go back to this. I'll, I'll end up with uh, this stuff up here. Okay, we have also worked, you can also work with uh, uh, things like little worms. They're small worms, a few microns long. Uh, I have a movie which if it starts to run here, uh, oops, that is not the movie. I think I've got to get rid of that, try it again. I wanted to show you what these look like when they crawl. It doesn't, oh, maybe it's going to work. That's too bad. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, it's a little bit slow. Anyway, yeah, there it is. So, these are the sort of worms that we, work with, that we have worked with. They're called C. elegant worms. They're something that many, many people work with. What we do is we put inside of these little worms uh, these fluorescent proteins that I was talking about that bind to certain proteins and we can tell where they go. And the uh, last movie that I really want to show uh, because I think it's very nice to see it has, uh, whoops, it has, uh, da, 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 pause I guess, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about but it's actually fantastic so I think I'll show it. This is a development of a worm from one egg into many eggs. And I just want to show it because it's, uh, I think it's neat to end up with. So you see you're getting lots of eggs but you still see different cells. So what's happening inside of there is that you're getting different types of cells that are growing, growing, growing. Pretty soon you'll see they'll start to invaginate in here. See, it comes down just like you see in a lot of embryos. Turns around, now you start to see something that's a little bit similar to a worm, right? And what we wanted to do with these in the future was actually put these fluorescent proteins into this worm and study the changes that are taking place in certain proteins while the worm is developing because it's very nice. You have to look at this underscope. And you keep, this comes out to the end in the end, and what you get is a worm, uh, whoops, okay, it started again, but maybe you saw it, the worm that comes out uh, in the end, okay, which looks very similar to a, it's still inside, but it will ha so-called hatch out, and then you'll see the worm come out, and then it will crawl, and what we're interested in doing is for musculature. Okay, so uh, we won't go over this because these are single molecule experiments that I may, oops, I didn't want to do that, that I may have wanted to show. What I want to show now, as soon as I turn this off, is uh, just think about the fact that photons, it's photons, energy levels, and everything else that make the light really, uh, the life really interesting and very colorful. This is a marketplace in Peru. I've never seen a marketplace that is colorful as they have in Peru. I found out they have, uh, in Peru, they have about 50 or 60 different types of potatoes. I don't know why. How many potatoes do we have in a store? Two or three types, right? Red ones, normal ones. Do you know who grows the most potatoes in the world? <laughs> they have a certain McDonald potato they grow. <laughs> and, and they actually uh, have a lot. But they have a lot of different types of potatoes. And I uh, just wanted to end up with this because I suppose about this time pretty soon you're going to go eat. Think about that while you're eating, that all of these colors and everything are essentially there because, because the, the different energy levels that you have and in your eyes also, I didn't even cover that. I mean, that's another important part, right, that your eyes can see that. And, uh, uh, and you can see all these different colors because you have photons and because you have different energy levels, and you can use that to study biology. So that was all. Thank you.